Hello everybody, this is Dr. Novak again. Uh, in this video, I wanted to explain about, which has been asked several times of me, about the substrate, plenum, how exactly it's working, why we do what we do, and how does it mimic that of a natural system. When I set the aquarium up, I show you in my previous videos that this is the first time you're watching. When I set this whole thing up, we made a plenum. Now, some comments were made that all I ever talk about is like I invented the undergravel filter. No, the undergravel filter, I never claimed I invented it. The undergravel filter is a filter plate used to go underneath the gravel, and it was used as far back as I can remember since the 40s. And undergravel filters were used and mimicked sewage treatment facilities. And the idea behind that was to move water through the substrate, since you have so much substrate in an aquarium, and to make it a biological filter. Very simple, very plain, the same thing that they use when they have sewage treatment plants. So, I never make any claim that I invented it. It is an old technology, but yet a lot of things we use on our aquarium keeping is very old technology. And it went out of favor. By the time the 80s came around, uh, wet dry filters start coming in and under gravel filters, the use of them became less and less to almost not existing. But manufacturers kept making the undergravel filter plates for those who still wanted to use an undergravel filter. And the idea behind it was to move lots of water, oxygenated water, and anything that was in there would go through the gravel and bacteria, autotrophic bacteria, uh, your nitrobacteria will convert and break down ammonia into nitrites and then into nitrates. All of us pretty well understand the cycle of how it goes. In the meantime, people said they were, they clogged up. Well, then we got uh, gravel vax and gravel vax helped keep the substrate open. But I can understand where they went out of favor. A 55 gallon tank would probably have four lift tubes because they had two plates in them, two two foot plates, and you would have four lift tubes and they were bubbling, you needed pumps. Uh, sometimes you would need one pump for each side of the aquarium. We're talking about a 55, you had four of these tubes you had to try to hide. And <clears throat> they didn't look very good in, a, in an aquarium. So I can understand where they would start falling out of favor or where people would prefer not to have them because they were unsightly. No matter what they did, they were kind of unsightly to have in the aquarium back in the 60s and 70s. But how that happened is you used to just have a small little bubbler of maybe a uh, half inch diameter tube, five eighths diameter tube, it'd be maybe six inches long, and it would just bubble up. And that's how it used to be. But as time went on, that became the change because they said if you pump more water, more oxygen through the substrate, eh, it would uh, do more work for you, carry more oxygen laden water into it with the breaking down of your organics in the aquarium. Now, inside the aquarium, the wood in here is an organic. The dying leaves are organics. Any of the fish waste is an organic. Anything that's that's organic, the leaves of the plant are organic. Anything that starts breaking down, that's organic, starts making ammonia. Besides the fish secreting ammonia 24-7, we have other problems with things that are making ammonia 24-7. And bacteria never stop. They are constant. So what I like to explain to people so they can try to understand and wrap their head around what are we doing now? Because 
some people have complained. All he's doing is using old technology, and uh, it, it's no good. I mean, he's acting like he invented it. No, I I didn't invent it. You know, I didn't invent the car engine, but we all use an engine to in our cars to drive. Yet that car engine in our car is well over 100 years old. The technology is. It's the same technology. It's a piston going up and down with valves that open and close and allow the exhaust gases and air to come in. Same technology. It hasn't changed in over 100 years. It's the same thing. We've just improved upon it. Same thing here. All we've done is taken old technology and we've improved upon it. I didn't invent the technology. I just improved upon it and have done the research to find out how we can improve upon it. And I stumbled across this when I did my research on the anoxic filtration system, a BCB basket. Now, a BCB basket is basically an open cell basket with kitty litter, laterite, or it could be anything that's comparable to kitty litter. And that would be like your oil dries. Uh, there's other names they may go by, generic names. Uh, uh, Zarb, uh, Safety Zarb. Uh, there, there's other names. But it's basically made by the same company. It's fired clay. It centers and it has a charge to it. And this charge is negatively charged and attracts positive ammonia, which is cats with their urine, and it starts breaking down, as we all know, into ammonia. It breaks down, and that attracts it and holds that until you get rid of the kitty litter when it's all filled up or when you start smelling it. But anyway, that's basically what a BCB was. You know, it doesn't mean you have to be stuck with kitty litter, but what, what I found out is that making this open cell basket, that I found out that one, it was charged, electrically charged. And a lot of hobbyists don't understand that you have electric charges in your aquarium. And these are positive charges, mainly positive. You have negative, but mainly the percentage is positive. You make a plenum, like this, and all this is going to be negatively charged, basically negatively charged. That is going to be dominant. Then underneath the plenum, which it, like here is an inch high, so this actually the substrate is not as high as it looks because there's over an inch of a void, which is a plenum. That is going to have a negative and positive charge in it from the ions that it is attracting. Okay. Hobbies don't understand that water is electrically charged because it's read in millivolts, very, very small voltages, and you need very sensitive equipment to measure these. So what has happened when the under gravel filter went out of favor because people couldn't grow plants because the water was moving very fast, soon airlift tubes uh, gave way to pumps, Pumps can move 150, 250 gallons per hour. You connect them up. Now they were moving. I even had an under gravel filter that each plate, each plate, two foot plate in a 55 gallon tank, was moving 600 gallons an hour in a reverse flow. So 600 gallons an hour was going from the bottom up. Okay. But they went out of favor because other technologies became more relevant and the hobbyists like them better. Wet dry filter is one example, but as the wet dry filter became very, very popular, then people realized um, they were nitrate producers. They could break down ammonia 30% faster than an outer gravel filter could because they were being saturated with oxygen and therefore the bacteria was more efficient at breaking down ammonia. But if you break down ammonia, then you're going to have nitrites and nitrates. And because of all this nitrates, 
they would connect it up to their saltwater aquariums and they said all they are is nitrate producers because they're causing all kinds of algae problems, right? Very common in saltwater aquariums. And because of that, they went out of favor. People didn't want the uh, nitrates because it was making too much and, it, and they just said they were nitrate factories and they fell out of favor. So what had happened through the years as hobbyists start progressing, some way, somehow, someone started that undergravel filters, you don't need them. And then they start placing their substrate directly on the bottom of an aquarium. But as research continued to go on, many things start cropping up that hobbies did not understand. And when you don't understand something, some hobbyists don't want to understand it. They just listen to what someone has told them and just do it. Sometimes it's out of laziness because it's easier just to take a bag of uh, a substrate and dump it in the aquarium. That's what you see now on YouTube. Take a bag, dump it in the aquarium. That's it. It can't get any more easier than that. But sometimes laziness has got us into the mess we're in today. There's no reason why today in the 21st century we are still fighting this filtration problem. Because if someone says, I have a better filtration than this guy, then why isn't the world using it? And that's it. Because it doesn't fit. One shoe does not fit all. And all filtration systems can work. Because I myself have been asked by people, they said, oh, I'd like to use your filter or this. I said, well, how's everything going? Oh, it's going fine. But I, I said, well, if it's going fine, don't use it. And they kind of look at you like, I thought you're going to give me the pitch I should use your filter. No. If what you are doing is working, don't change it. Really, if what you are, I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're using a system that uses no air and, and, and no water movement. If it's working, don't change it. It's not broke, don't fix it. But in most cases, when people start looking, it's because something is broke, something is not working for them. They're getting advice from other people, and the advice they're getting is not working. So they move on to find out, where can I get the correct advice for what I want to do for my applications? What I found out, though, is the BCB basket, because it moved ions, it moved in and out, it actually cleaned ponds. And it did what I wanted to do through my research of, of kept studying how it would attract ions and constantly not produce another waste product. It produced N2, denitrogen, because of the bacteria it was growing. And I thought to myself that you can use this in aquariums too. But in an aquarium, we have another problem, which ponds don't really want to deal with, and that is a substrate. So in a pond, we don't want to deal with substrates. Now, there are companies like, let's say, Aquascape or something, they will put down in a pond a lot of rocks and boulders for cosmetic reasons. They will take the water lilies sometimes and plant them directly in to where the rocks and boulders are. And... That's how their system kind of works. They use all the rocks and boulders and everything to grow bacteria on, and it is supposed to establish the system so your fish can live and your water becomes nice and clear. But it's with the understanding that every year you either hire them or you do it yourself by breaking down the pond, emptying the pond, removing all the fish, and power washing everything down so you don't have a buildup of muck and dirt 
and grind because ponds are thousands of times dirtier than your aquarium is. Okay, and they, they accumulate a lot of debt, algae, muck, dirt, everything from the air, and they're very, very dirty and filthy. That's why the filtration systems have to be very, very large for ponds. So you have to have a very powerful filtration system. So that's why when I made the anoxic filter, making a separate filter, I allowed the water from the pond to go into the filter. It acts like a settlement chamber. The biosynosis clarification baskets do their work by creating your uh, nitrosomatis and nitrous, uh, all that bacteria that you need to break down ammonia and everything. But it also created a specialized bacteria that would take the end byproduct of nitrates and utilize them and phosphates. So phosphate and nitrates also went down. But there's a lot of other technology out there, like uh, for example, the Nexus filter. It has a churning filter, uses air and churning, uses a plastic medium, the bacteria grow in the medium. It is not designed to be only a biological filter. So therefore, you must have other filters to clean the water. The Nexus was only designed for biological purposes, not for mechanical. So therefore, the churning of the substrate that was in there, whether it be plastic or whatever, K1, whatever they're using, bacteria will build up a polymeric adhesive, stick to the plastic medium that's constantly being churned. And you can think of that as like a sand filter that's constantly being churned up. And it would grow on that and it would do the work without clogging up because it's constantly being churned up. And the dirt and detritus and everything would go on to other filters that would filter it out. This is for biological purposes. So you try to highly oxygenate the water, let the bacteria do its job, and then send it off the water to be clean. Once again, all taken from more or less sewage treatment plants. In our aquarium, we can't bubble up the substrate. You know, we can't do that. So when I did the 20-gallon tank, and I showed everybody how to do a plenum there, I redid it in this tank with the 20 gallon tank, I just used a normal under gravel filter, like a Lees or whatever. In this tank, I used a plenum that was an inch high. Uh, as I explained, the plates are an inch high. They're well made, came from China, got them off the internet from Amazon. And because this is a bigger tank, I was able to make it thicker. But the whole point of, of this is, is when I made this tank and I talked to several people. The substrate I use is fluval substrate, stratus substrate, and there's different makers, ADA, there's other makers that make, and the substrate is very expensive. It goes from $20, I saw a bag up to $60 or more for something like ADA. It's very expensive. A lot of people made comments about the fluval substrate that it wears out after about three years and needs to be replaced. And I was thinking to myself, I, I, don't, I don't get that. Why, why does it need to be replaced? If you use the same technology as, let's say, agriculture, where you grow a crop, we all know, and then they harvest the crop, they turn the soil over, um, you could plant a different crop on that land, like let's say alfalfa or something, to put something back into the soil, or you're going to have to fertilize the soil to put your next crop because you're going to exhaust your soil. Any farmer knows that. But they said this becomes exhausted, or they would use a dirt aquarium. And they said after a while it becomes exhausted and you have to break the whole tank down. And I'm thinking to myself, that doesn't make any sense. That you are breaking something down that should never have to be broken down. Now, don't think manufacturers are stupid. They know this. In the 20-gallon tank, I use, on purpose, I use just gravel. 
ordinary plain gravel. It's I've had that gravel easily for 20 years plus. And my plants were growing great in plain gravel. Gravel has nothing in it. It's inert. It's just gravel. It, it's got nothing to offer a plant versus this supposedly has nutrients and stuff in it, the fluval and some of the other products out there, and the plants will use those nutrients. Now, I want to remind you, I've been doing research for 30 plus years. A long time ago, when I started this research and started writing about it and putting it on the internet, no manufacturer had this kind of substrate. No manufacturer gave the hobbyists anything with iron in it. Not until it got, not until I start publishing papers and stuff and start getting the word out, did they all of a sudden start changing and making uh, fluval red and stuff like that, that, that manufacturers actually started going towards adding some iron to their substrate. Because with the research I was doing, and trust me, people, I had a lot of PhDs contacting me, asking me, how did I do this, or what did I do, or the test I conducted. You know, I don't know where they were from. They could have been from companies. I don't know. But then all of a sudden, it started popping up more and more and more because of me using the kitty litter. They don't want you buying kitty litter. They don't want you buying oil dry, $6 a bag, or kitty litter for $4 a bag. It's cheap. It's dirt cheap. So they started making substrates, and I thought, oh, that's pretty funny that they're making substrates now with iron built in it, but charging 20 30 bucks a bag, and the hobbyists can buy a lot cheaper substrates or make their own just about. Well, of course, they don't want you to do that. They want you to sell you a product. So now these newer products have come out to sell you, but there's no reason they're becoming exhausted. And the only reason is a long time ago, they made fertilizer tablets that you would put into your substrate to help your plants grow. Well, the crypt that's over here, I pulled out of the other aquarium. And of course, uh, I had to hold the plates down because it was growing inside the plate, the roots were. And I literally had to hold it down and pull the plant out what I could, and I transplanted what I took out over in this aquarium. Because a lot of the plants came from the 20 gallon. A little bit of the plant stayed in the 20, a little bit of it. It's growing back. It's growing back right now, that plant is. It's growing back though in a substrate that's not nearly as good as this. It's nothing but gravel. So why is it growing back very, very nicely in just ordinary gravel? That's the question we have to ask when I'm not feeding it any tabs or anything else. Now, it has some bladderite in there, but that's about it. But that tank now is over a year old. So what keeps feeding the plant? Well, that's where the science comes in, and this is where people start failing and not understanding the science behind what I am showing you, the hobbyists. When we take and put a substrate directly on the bottom, okay, you need to have water movement going through the substrate. And one way people suggest to do that is by adding a lot of plants. And a lot of plants with a root system, a vascular system, a root system. The root system has to develop, of course, before things really start working. So the hobbyist is on needle and pins waiting for that vascular system to open up. Another thing of it is, is that if you put fertilizer tablets to a plant, which is what I found out with uh, like water lilies. Now in my book and everything else, I show pictures of ponds with plants, never using a fertilizer tablet ever. 
and yet the plants are beautifully green, they're flowering like crazy, and they never once had a fertilizer tablet or any fertilizer put into the pond to grow like that, where other people would have to add fertilizer tablets to get their plants to flower and grow. And, you know, hobbyists after hobbyists were known in that, that when they put a plant in a BCB, the plant grew bigger, it grew stronger, and water lilies grew great, never using a bit of fertilizer. And they would always ask me, well, why is that? I'm, I'm not getting this. Why, it, why does everybody put fertilizer in their uh, lilies or their arrow or whatever they have? And here I'm putting this in a BCB basket and I'm not adding any fertilizer. There's science behind that. It's because the baskets are bringing water in with nutrients and the plants are working to get those nutrients and convert them into amino acids and protein and their energy to grow and flower. You have to have some way to bring water in to the plant. Now in natural systems, this is already automatically working. Water is going in and out of a natural system, okay, and therefore nutrients are constantly being brought into the rhizomes of the water lilies, and it builds up a root system, but a root system just is not good enough. If you put a fertilizer tablet next to a plant, which I have found out, it makes the plant lazy. And what they don't develop then is called hair roots and proliferation, meaning that you get all these small hair roots that start helping the main root take in nutrients, okay? When you put a fertilizer tablet next to a water lily, these root systems get lazy. They don't have to work anymore. They're constantly surrounded by nutrients and they don't have to go very far and really work because it's just bombarding them with nitrates or the, that's in the thing, phosphates, nitrates, what's in the fertilizer tablet. And what I found out is the plants don't work very hard to clean your system. It was always wiser to have a substrate that would help your plants along, but some way, somehow, the water movement has to go in there and keep flowing in and out. So planting your plant in dirt, a friend of mine, he would plant all his plants in dirt. He was a professor of uh, zoology and ichthyology, and he did the microbiology along with uh, aquatic botany, and he owned a big garden center of nothing but aquatic plants. Nothing but aquatic, that's all he, he dealt in was aquatic plants. And he would plant things in dirt. And then people would say, I don't want dirt because the fish got into it and messed up my whole pond. So they prefer another kind of medium. And then if they did stick with the dirt, because he stuck with the dirt, cause as we know, we use it in our aquariums, it has lots of nutrients in it. And because he's dealing on a large scale with lotus and stuff like that, he used dirt. But in our aquarium, it's a little different using dirt. It has a lot of nutrients. So that's why you see people that use dirt and then they have to cap it off with something because they don't want all those nutrients going back into the water column. They don't want that. There's, there's so many nutrients in there that it's going to mess up the whole aquarium and you're going to start getting all kinds of algae problems hair algae, string algae, beard algae, uh, all kinds of problems you can start ending up with. So they need to get their plants to grow. So how do I get my plant to grow in gravel versus people are placing their substrate at the bottom of the aquarium? What is different? Well, the difference is we are using what is used in a natural system. Through my tests, and research, I found out that moving water through the system, it has to be aided some way. We just can't throw it at the bottom of an aquarium. It's got to be aided. Listen to what people say. If you place a substrate like this, let's say, at the bottom of your aquarium and 
you don't have aggressive plants or you don't have plants to help clean everything up, you're going to end up with a problem. This has been shown on YouTube where a guy had two aquariums, the exact same plants, the exact same lights, okay, the exact same amount of fish, the exact same amount of food. But one tank had no CO2, the other tank did have CO2. The one with CO2 he had zero nitrates and phosphate. The one without CO2, the nitrates and phosphate kept rising. Okay, this now falls under the Leibig minimum law, which is whatever element is at minimum is what's going to dictate how well your plants are going to grow. And apparently in the other aquarium that did not have CO2, that was what was lacking. So it's only going to grow so good until you give it more CO2 so the plants can work for you. And this is where the misconception comes in that hobbies, I don't want to use CO2, fine. But you have to then make a balancing act because your plants are not going to utilize what you want them to utilize unless they're very aggressive, very fast growing, and you know what you're doing. If you're not going to use CO2, then you're going to need a ton of plants. As, for example, Father Fish says, you need 70% plants. It's a lot of plants. Uh, if that's what you want to do, fine. It works. But just remember, as I have always said, plants are unreliable. Plants, they live, they die, they go dormant, they slow up. They're just like terrestrial plants. One day you got a bush, the next day that bush dies. No different in an aquarium. Some of these plants only have so much energy that they're going to give to grow. And then after that, they're going to cease. Um, for example, you get your, like a Madagar lace plant. Beautiful plant. Gorgeous plant. I think it's probably the best plant you could buy out there. It grows real nice. It grows big. It flowers. And then all of a sudden, it starts getting smaller and smaller leaves because it has the rest. It has to go in a resting period. A lot of plants have to go in a resting period. Even here in Florida, as nice as the weather is, a lot of trees and plants go into a resting period. And, in fact, anyone who lives in Florida will confirm this, that you got like your arrows and your or pickerel weed and stuff like that on the side of the roads. Well, during winter time, these all die back. Now, why? It's warm enough for them to keep growing because they have to go into a resting period. And now the weather's getting warmer and all those bogs and everything are beginning to grow again. Okay, they went through their resting period. Same thing happens in your aquarium. Plant may grow great, Amazon sort of, then it goes into a resting period. Well, it's not working now. That's why I've always said you can't depend on plants 100%. And we've all been through this where we've had a plant growing great, and then we've had to replace it. That's common. It happens to terrestrial plants. It happens to aquatic plants. Okay? And nature, nature deals with it, but we are constantly buying plants and having to turn over our plants or you'll see, for example, you get a, uh, like Ludwig or something, you keep cutting it down, right? Uh, Spiraria, you keep cutting it down, and all of a sudden, one day you cut it all down, and it doesn't grow. And you think to yourself, uh, what happened? It's been growing perfect. Now I cut it down once again to trim it, and it's not growing. It happens. It's going into a resting period. It's, it's growing so fast, and then all of a sudden you keep cutting it down, giving it a haircut, and finally it goes into a rest. So it's not working the way it is, and pretty soon you may turn around and just pull the whole plant out and replace it with nice, fresh plant. Very common. That's why I say plants are very unreliable, depend on filtration. What is reliable with filtration is bacteria. That's a constant. That's no matter what you do, whether you don't have plants or not, the constant is bacteria. So that's what we really need to rely on. So now, by doing the plenum and making a slow moving plenum, now the slow moving plenum is something I came up with. Yes, I came up with that. Because the original plenum was designed that you did it the same way I did it, but it had 
no bubbler or no way of moving it. It moved through diffusion and it moved through electrical charge. Okay, very slowly. So it would diffuse and come because as I explained to you, you have negative, positive, and positive, negative into your plenum. Okay, then I thought if we move the water very slowly like a natural system, but we have to do it slowly and we have to do it smart. We can't turn these back into the 1970s under gravel filters because they are not mechanical filters, they are biological filters. So what I found out, and that's why I showed you how I did this with a little bitty bubbler for a 36 by 24 aquarium. I mean, this is a big under gravel filter, if you want to call it. But I have a little bitty 5H tube, six inches long, bubbling. That's not moving much water, but it's di displacing the water that's in the bottom of the plenum. So water is coming through. Now here's what happens. To explain to you exactly what happens, why this substrate is going to last 10, 20 years, 30 years. Because what happens if you can move what's in the water column down into the substrate, the bacteria in here then can utilize it. Makes sense, right? If it moves too slowly and the water stops with oxygen and gets depleted, then you have a problem at the bottom here of uh, hydrogen sulfide or anything else, the blackening of the soil or blackening of the roots of the plant. Like I said, the crypt I pulled out of the 20 gallon, those roots were as white as snow, white as snow, no blackening, no brown, no nothing. They were as white as snow. They were pristine and I put them in this aquarium. That's how this plant will look after a year or more. The roots will be as white as snow and they were already going down into the plates. So what we want to do is we want to move water and aid it. I found out works the best. So you have good, better, best. So do you need to have a bubbler or something like that? No. But it works a little better if you do. Moving water slowly. For example, the guy in New York, he has wild discus from South America. He spawned them. They spawned within well, three weeks after he owned them. Uh, they ate the eggs. And guess what? He contacted me last night and said, they're spawning again. Now, this is an, an aquarium that uses a plenum, and it has BCBs in the sump, okay? And he's already spawning wild discus in his aquarium. Now this doesn't mean he does it every week do a little water change. Yeah, he has a piece of tape on his aquarium where he drops the water to and refills it. And I told him to remove, he had a, a brick, a ceramic brick in the sump and some other stuff. I said, remove all that. You don't need it anymore. You don't need it. Only have the BCB in your sump, your carbon, your pump to pump it back and make sure you clean your socks. That's all you need. Forget all the other stuff. What, why I said that is because if you have more producers than users, you're gonna have an imbalance in your aquarium. Okay, what you need is more users than producers. And I said, those are designed to make nitrates as an end byproduct. You don't want that. Get anything out of the aquarium that's gonna be designed to make nitrates as an end byproduct byproduct. So what we have here is you oxygenated water is coming in. So you're going to have your audio troughs breaking down any ammonia that's coming in here and waste products from organic waste product going into the substrate. We all know that. That's, that's nothing new. The point of it is as the water keeps coming down, the oxygen becomes depleted because heterotrophic bacteria can become so plentiful it can deplete the oxygen inside of here. That's what happens when you make a substrate and put it at the bottom of your aquarium. The water is moving so ungodly slow that it 
all the oxygen gets taken away and you wind up with anaerobic conditions. You go from aerobic to anaerobic. And this, as the water starts going, the oxygen becomes depleted. It gets at a very low level, like two parts per million, 0.5 parts per million. Well, once you hit that two parts per million, okay, nitrosomatis can't live. Nitrobacteria cannot live. Oxygen is way too slow. It will not perform. And some of the bacteria, when oxygen gets at low, just dies. It cannot exist in oxygen once it gets to two parts per million. But there is another bacteria that I use in the BCB, which is called heterotrophic anaerobic fatutative bacteria. Now, this is something that hobbies didn't hear about. Nobody ever talked about it. It's a long name. People heard nothing about this bacteria. How to utilize it. How to make conditions to grow this bacteria, favorable conditions for this bacteria. Because this bacteria will do the same thing as our autotrophic bacteria will do, but it will even take it a step further by breaking down ammonia into nitrites, into nitrates, break down the nitrate into N2. And then if it, oxygen levels go real low, it will take and steal oxygen from other sources. That's great. Phosphates. It steals the oxygen from phosphates and it makes it so it doesn't become anything that's going to cause a problem in the aquarium. Okay? But you have to have specialized conditions. The conditions are easy to make. I've been showing you on my video. You saw me set up the aquarium. You see what the aquarium looks like. I'm not hiding anything from you. And the reason I say that this substrate will not die is because what you're doing is when you feed your tank a chemical of uh, iron, magnesium, what, whatever you're buying, you know, whether aquarium co-ops or, or sea cams or whatever you're buying to fertilize your aquarium, that goes into solution. Hopefully before it oxidizes, because once it oxidizes, the plants can't use it. The plants are going to use it, but basically they use this through their vascular system, their root system. Okay. The better the root system is, the better it's going to utilize the fertilizer you're giving it. That's why in the 20 gallon, the root system was, was huge like this of that crypt that's sitting over there. And some of that stayed in that aquarium. It's regrowing. It's got no fertilizer. So why is it doing that? Because we're bringing what's in the water column down through into the substrate. And then we're moving the water. So the water is constantly moving. Imagine that the water comes in, it moves out. The water comes in, it's moving out. So this substrate will never die because it's constantly being fed by what is in the water column because you have more than enough pollution and organic matter breaking down to feed the bacteria in here as long as you keep water movement going. If it goes too fast, then you have too much oxygen and all you're doing then is going to break down ammonia into nitrates, it's an end byproduct. If it goes at the right speed, then you are gonna take care of everything. This would explain why the fellow in New York, which I showed my last little video of his aquarium, his wild discs are spawning for the second time. Now, any of you who have been in this hobby a long time know that when you have wild discs and you're trying to breed wild discs, it's hard, okay? It was almost impossible years and years ago, but that's how they had to do it. They had to take the wild discs and try to breed them so we would have the discs we have today. And now the discs we have today are more hybrids because they've been spawned so many times. We've you know, got the color just the way we want, but taking something from the wild and bringing it in, that was no easy trick. 
believe me, the old timers are probably right now shaking their head. Yeah, I remember those days. Every freaking day you were doing water changes, sometimes twice a day, to try to get those things to spawn. Here, this guy's having no problems. He's not having a bit of problems because he is utilizing what nature, what they came out of. He's using the science that Mother Nature gave those discs in South America in his fish tank. And because he's utilizing that science, he's tricking the fish. And they're spawning twice now. And believe me, 30, 40 years ago, this was not easy. Because people did not understand, and the undergravel filter itself did not work for them. Okay, a lot different than using a plenum. And that's why I say using a plenum. I'm not trying to diss the person who invented the under gravel filter or the under gravel filter plates. I'm not trying to diss them, take away any of their gl glory. All I'm doing is saying we can use these plates and use them the correct way, like in my 20 gallon and in this 90 gallon. And in the next aquarium I'm going to make, we're going to think about how am I going to use that. I may only use BCBs in that tank. Because I know those BCBs are going to, anything I put in that tank, it's going to handle. And I won't even have to use a subject. But I did this because we all like plants. So we know that as what's in here is coming slowly in here, we know the plants can utilize it. But there's, as you notice, there's not algae all over everything. And, and because we need to get what's in here out of here. So we got to do it either through a canister filter, you've got to do it through a hang on the back filter to get the pollution out, or we got to use a wet dry filter. We got to use some way of getting in and out, but we have a big, huge aquarium that can help us by utilizing the substrate that's in there because we can't depend on plants. And if you think about it, I don't have a lot of plants with roots in here in this substrate. A lot of it is uh, wood, which is organic, it's breaking down. Uh, Java fern, that, that's not helping us. You know, that's that's not even making a root system inside here. Um, my Anubias, it's not really making a root system that's going inside the... So I have very little help in this aquarium to utilize anything that's in the substrate. I have a few plants. They seem to be doing well. They're growing. When you put a new plant in, it's got to build up its vascular system, its root system. And we all know that. And in the meantime, then, once it starts building up that system, then it will start just like a terrestrial plant. Like if you plant a tree, the first year, trees don't do much because they're building their root system. The second year, they'll do a little better. They're still building their root system but they may do just a little bit of growing. It's not until that third year where you'll see the growth starting to go on a tree because by then the root system is more developed to feed the rest of the plant. Okay, very common. Same thing we're doing here. You put a new plant in, it's, and a lot of people will cut the roots and everything. Put them. That's got to redevelop. So you got to wait that time out if you're not going to utilize bacteria you got to wait it out. And if for any reason that plant is slowed up, it's not going to utilize at 100%. That's when you could start running into problems. Then algae can start taking over, and it becomes the dominating factor in the aquarium. Because algae doesn't need much in nutrients. Okay, your plants do, algae does not. These are your higher order plants. The algae does not. So as I made this, you have to have a balancing act. Now, I know a lot of people are probably thinking, holy cow, I didn't know this aquarium hobby had so much science and chemistry in it, but it really does. And you can eliminate, of course, the science and chemistry by just having an empty aquarium, put your fish in, and just change the water once or twice a day. Because then you'll eliminate the pollution that's in there. But because we don't want to do that, and we have trouble doing that, let's say, in the summertime, which is coming up upon us because we're super busy. We need to depend on something to carry over 
when we can't attend to our aquariums like we want. So for example, the ADA canister that I have in here, which I showed you in my thing, it hasn't been cleaned now in over 60 days. But it has, that's basically a mechanical filter and it has a BCB basket in the very center and it hasn't been cleaned in over 60 days, which is great for a lot of hobbies because they don't want to be doing maintenance every single day. Now, according to a lot of hobbies, well, that canister filter is starting to get dirty. It's going to make pollution, and that's going to start messing up your aquarium. So you have to keep your filter super, super clean, okay, because you're going to start loading it up full of organics. But utilizing this the way it is, you're having bacteria utilize what is being made in that canister filter with the big BCP basket, it's utilizing the nitrates and making ammonia and stuff like that with the autotrophic bacteria that grows on the outside. And as you get deeper and deeper, bacteria starts going into the fasciitata bacteria, which is the, the demorphic bacteria, and it handles the waste. But there is a balancing act. You don't want more producers than users. So in this, this is a great way to have a very large filter with users than producers. So as the producers, as the water's coming down, if you can understand this, they make the waste. They make, they take the organics, break it down to ammonia. The water's moving down with the ammonia in the water, even though you test your water and it'll say zero ammonia, you still have ammonia in there. Um, Aquaria Koa had a little session. He explained that too, where you're always going to have ammonia in your water. Your test kit may not read it, but it's always there because the fish are constantly producing ammonia. Okay, it's constantly pr producing that. So you want that to come in here so bacteria can utilize it. But as this is making a waste, we need to get that waste and utilize that waste and get it out of the system. So a lot of people will say, okay, but the plants need the nitrogen. Okay, then I would have to explain how did the plants and ponds do so well without adding nitrogen tablets around the root system? How do they do so well? Because plants actually are looking for ammonia. The ammonia exists all over. So they're utilizing that ammonia. That's what you want them to do. The root system will take what's available. And if the ammonia becomes exhausted, then and only then will they go on to taking nitrates and convert it in, into a nitrite and then into ammonia. That means they can only do that when they are photosynthesizing, meaning their, their engine is running at full speed. Now they can do, because it's chemical work, it takes energy to do that, to take a nitrate and convert it back into a food source that they can use, which is ammonia. There are some exceptions to the rule. It's uh, water hyacinth, for example. 75% of its uptake is nitrogen, and only 25% is ammonia. So they are nitrate users. That's why a lot of people will use water lettuce or they'll use a water hyacinth in their ponds because they know they will take in nitrates over ammonia and help bring the nitrates down. In our aquariums, we can't have floating plants like that. A lot of people do, though. As you notice, they use duckweed. They use other means of floating plants to help clean up their water with the root systems dangling in the water, but it also blocks out light. So it's a two-edged sword. It's doing something, but it's blocking out the lights, but it's a yin and yang. You know what I mean? It, 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 it just depends on how it's going to utilize the food stuff that's in your aquarium and what you're trying to do underneath all that shade because too much shade is going to affect the way your plants are going to grow or they're not going to grow that good at all. That's why I've said in 
my thing when I use CO2, I don't bring it up to 30 parts per million, but they're growing good and they're growing fast enough for me to be happy. But I do understand that they could even grow faster and better if I was using more CO2, but I don't want to. They growing fast enough and good enough for me and I'll leave them alone. Okay, because it's very simple to me. So as this is going in, water is going in and out of the substrate constantly, we don't have to depend on our plants. If they fail, don't worry about it. If they cannot utilize all of what you're giving them, food stuff, it will go down in here and the bacteria will utilize it. That's what we want. The bacteria is the constant here because it will only change when the food stuff change, okay, the more food stuff you bring in, the more the bacteria will grow, okay? But as we all know, autotrophic de bacteria depends on oxygen. And this is where another failure comes in. If there's a lot of oxygen and you feed a lot, then they can utilize the food stuff. If there's not enough oxygen and you bring in a lot of food stuff, they cannot utilize that food stuff and the food stuff therefore pollutes the system. And we call that eutrophification, meaning the tank is warped and you have done a hundred years of damage that it would take a pond hundreds of years to do you have achieved it in no time at all. That now you have an imbalance in the, in the whole tank. So if you bring the food stuff into here and you're using the correct bacteria, the Factutata bacteria, that bacteria doesn't need high oxygen. So what it does as the food stuff comes in, it multiplies. Okay, it's not like the autotrophs that are depending on a lot of oxygen. And if you give it too much food stuff, it, it can't multiply fast enough because there's not enough oxygen or not enough space for it to grow. That's why you see people keep adding more filtration and, and a brick of this and this. And I got bio balls. And I got, they keep adding more because they think that the more surface area they're giving their bacteria, the more bacteria they're going to have. But that all depends on oxygen, too. With Factutata bacteria, it doesn't matter. The oxygen, like I said, go down to two parts per million, all the way down even to zero. They will utilize and keep working as long as you got. And look at, you got a lot of surface area. My 20 gallon here, you got a lot of surface area for that bacteria to grow. You just have to give it the right conditions to grow. The bacteria can live in cold water. It can live in hot water. Now, what I mean by hot water is, you know, it can live in 90 degree, 100 degree water. It doesn't matter. It can live in freezing cold water, below freezing. Okay, it doesn't need to go dormant like our audiotroph bacteria, some of our audiotrophs have to do. If the temperature goes too low, they die. If their food stuff is not available, they do not have a means of utilizing a different food source. They die. Not factutated bacteria. They use all kinds of things as a food source and oxygen source. So they stay alive. And that's the whole reason and the trick of balancing out the science of the aquarium. Now, I know I told all this to you. There's still going to be people who doubt it, and that's okay. If, if you doubt it, that doesn't work, fine. Don't, don't use it. You know, I'm not forcing anybody to use it. I'm just telling you the science behind it and how it works and why it works. Because this substrate here, this fluval, it's not going to go bad because you're constantly taking what's in the water column and putting it into here. So it doesn't matter whether or not this becomes exhausted because it will really never become exhausted. 
like the 20 gallon tank that's using normal stones that's inert it, it won't benefit any plant that's the same with this uh, one day it may become inert who cares you're still bringing what's in the water column down in the here so bacteria and roots can utilize it and that's what the roots of a plant needs they need it to their roots you need to keep moving what's in here down here so they the roots can utilize it and and then they will work you whenever i make a tank like this or the, or the other aquarium i never use fertilizer tablets do not use fertilizer tablets they're going to cause more pain than what they're worth you don't need them because think of the science you're making all kinds of pollution in here. Bring it down here so the plant roots can use it and the bacteria can utilize it. So you got two means that it can be utilized. If you don't have plants, you don't need plants. Let the bacteria utilize it. Get a you got to get a chemistry balancing act by not overdoing. This is why watch the videos. People have barely any fish in their tank. I just watched a video, I won't mention their name. They had a big 125 gallon tank and they had maybe six, seven fish in it. And I'm talking about uh, rainbow fish. It's like in a 125 gallon tank, that's all you got in it. And then when he showed the close up of the tank, you could see beard algae growing on the plants. And so the balancing act is not being done. The chemistry is failing. Because now I could see when the camera came up close, you barely had any fish for a 125 gallon tank. And then I could see the beard algae growing on the plants. That's not a good sign either. That means you're out of kilter, your chemistry's out of kilter. So. This is the only way to do it. This is the way Mother Nature does it. I'm not telling you anything new. This is millions of years old. All I'm doing is relaying the information. What you do with that information, you want to throw it in the trash can, go with it, throw it in the trash can. It doesn't matter to me. It's, it's not my aquarium. It's not my fish. I cannot dictate to you what to do. I'm just telling you the science behind it and why it works. And if you were going to, let's say, set this up and you had digging fish like uh, your geophagus, for example, you would just put about an inch down one of those uh, craft screens. They'd come in black, different color, clear, black. And then you would just fill up the rest. It's still going to work the same, except when the fish dig, they can, they can only go down to the screen and then that's it. They're not going to disturb the rest of the plenum. They can't disturb it. Then all you have to do is the hobbyists go back, and push the gravel back, whatever. And the good thing of it is, is, is you can build this up and then put a screen in and then put the substrate you want on top of the screen, what your preference is. Okay, because this, you don't, you want this to be within one to three millimeters or anywhere between a, even a, a half millimeter. Okay, uh, 39 thousandths, even half of that you can start your substrate at no more than three millimeters okay is what we prefer and this substrate here kind of meets that requirement see they're not stupid people who, who make this stuff they're not stupid they know exactly what they're doing they do it on purpose but how do you utilize their product that's entirely up to you they can't tell you but they know that they make a product like this they know how you're going to utilize it by just taking their bag and dumping it. And they know after about three years, you're going to have to break down the aquarium and replace it. Hey, for them, that's it's great. You, you just keep buying this substrate as much as you want. They don't care. But on a tank like this, set up this way, uh, you're not going to have to ever replace the substrate. You're never going to have to feed it because whatever you're putting into the aquarium, your liquid iron and stuff like that, it's all going to end up down here to feed your plants anyway. You know that. You know that because that is the physics of how this works. From videos I have shown you, 
you are moving water through here and you're not a lot you're moving it at just the right amount to make the right amount conditions for the facutate of the work you're not putting it at the very bottom and then as movement goes slower and slower or stops completely then you develop anaerobic conditions now you start if the roots are down there they turn black that's why the roots that I pulled out of the 20 gallon were lily white they were just as white as can be snow white no black roots and I've had people tell me yeah I pulled my plants out and I saw some of the roots they were all black because once again the roots went down to the very bottom where there was no oxygen and it was killing off the plant and the roots and they were wondering what's wrong with my plant it was growing great and and, he, and the guy said I pulled it out and then I saw the roots turning black I said that's the reason why plants cannot live in conditions where there is no oxygen and they can only do so so much to help you so I hope this video kind of explain how it works why you're doing it this way whether or not you want to do it totally up to you no I did not invent the undergravel filter but I did discover the slow moving plenum which a plenum came up uh, in France actually a long time ago about making a plenum. I just start working on it and decided that we need to move water just a little bit faster. If we can add like a little bubbler, it doesn't have to be big, doesn't have to be a one inch tube even. It doesn't have to be a lot of bubbler. All we need to do is displace water. Make sure we're constantly moving a little bit of water underneath here so it gets displaced. Then we're guaranteed that movement continuously so the system doesn't collapse. Okay, and you're bringing nutrients from here down to here. So you don't have to worry about when the nutrients are gone from here, you don't have to worry about that. Now I gotta buy a new substrate. Substrate should last forever. Just like in my other aquariums that the substrate is actually this stone. So the next time on my next video, what I'm going to talk about is the lighting system. There's things that why I bought the lighting system I have and what spectrum of lighting I was looking for and why I bought it. Okay, and I'm going to do a little review on it. It's not going to be your typical review. I'm not going to go through all the stuff of the lighting that most people go through, but I will explain to you why I am utilizing a light that really is being utilized more of on saltwater aquariums. It is capable of doing freshwater aquariums, but I'm going to explain to you how I use it and why I pick that and try to explain to you what spectrum of lighting I am using and why I'm using it in my next video. So until the next time, this is Dr. Noy. Thank you for watching. Oh, there was one thing I'll, I'll bring up this. Um, I apologize because the quality of these videos aren't very good, but I started doing some research and I found out that some of these video that people make for YouTube, uh, one guy has a greenhouse of fish, you know, he's, he's a breeder. I mean, his camera was like over $2,000. Lens he's using, over $2,000. He's using expensive mics, and I'm not using that. I'm sorry, I'm not using it. I don't have the, the people watching this. I don't have any money coming in. This is everything out of my pocket, you know. So if the sound quality isn't great, if the videos aren't the greatest videos you're watching, I apologize for that. But you gotta remember, all this is coming out of my pocket to teach you. And you have to remember that. I'm doing the best I can with, with what I got. As they say, you juggle the hot potatoes the best you can. And that's what I'm kind of doing because at least I'm getting the information out. Uh, I apologize that they're they're not better. I wish I could did have a $2,000 camera in, and I wish I got donations from manufacturers so I could do reviews. But manufacturers don't probably like a guy like me because I tell it the way it is. I'm an engineer. I'm going to look at it and tell you. 
If it's good, if it's bad, if it wasn't engineered correctly, can you reverse engineer it and make it yourself? I'm going to tell you the truth because that's just the way I am. If you're, if you're looking for a soft review, there's plenty of YouTube videos out there that are going to give you a real nice, you know, softball review. I am not because that is just the way I am. I don't want you spending your money on something that is not good, doesn't work, too noisy, it was not designed right, and they could make it better. And like the review I did on the ADA canisters, okay, well, those things are made like a tank. They use the best Milwaukee pumps you can buy. Uh, they're going to outlast the hobbyists. They're expensive. But if you wanted a canister filter that's never going to break, uh, is that the route you have to go spending that much money? Well, I guess so. That's all I can say. I guess so. What choice do you have? You either spend the money, pay the piper, or you keep doing what I did, and like other hobbyists, they break and you're fixing them, they break, and then you finally give up, and you buy another filter, and it breaks, and, it, and you go through that routine, and by that time, you've already spent the money on an 88 as the years go by. Okay, believe me, I've had lots of Eheims, I've had Fluvals, two or three Fluvals, uh, I've had some of the other Italian filters, the motors wind up breaking, burning up, whatever. It's a shame you got to pay that kind of money to get a good canister filter. I hate doing it. I don't like doing it. It's a lot of money. I don't like telling you that you have to spend this kind of money to get a beautiful canister filter that will last you the rest of your life or the rest of the time you're in the hobby. The most you'll have to do probably 10 years from now is replace a motor. They're quiet. A lot of people, oh, they're noisy. Well, I don't hear the motor in the cabinet. Cabinet doors are closed. I don't hear these Milwaukee motors. Uh, I guess it was out in the open I would hear the humming, but they're no louder than an air pump. And I have the smallest air pump you can humanly possibly buy from Tetra. Those motors are no louder than that. They're, they're even softer because of the frequency of the sound wave that, that's coming out of it. The air pump is more irritating than the Awaki motors are, at least to me. So, you know, the thing I don't like with this aquarium, which I will admit, I don't like the bubbling noise, but what am I going to do? But, you know, I've been in this hobby a long time, and sometimes it's the obvious. You know, when you were a kid, we this is what we had. And it kind of reminds you of what we had. But today I know everybody wants everything quiet. You know. Well, there's nothing I can do about that. But anyway, I did want to say that. I apologize. These, these videos I make, they're not the best. I know that. You know, you guys don't really have to tell me. I do not have the money. I do not have the subscribers. You know, I wish you would subscribe. It would be nice if manufacturers gave me stuff like they do all the other people out there. Uh, most of your YouTube videos are coming from um, stores, people that own businesses. I don't own a business, okay? I'm not anymore. I'm retired. I don't own a business or anything. I'm just doing this to help you guys out basically for free. And on top of all that, I'm answering questions continuously when people email me or ask you. I try to get to your questions. I try to answer them the best I can for you. And this is all being done on my dime. And I'm not getting any help. So try to understand that, that when you watch these videos, yeah, they may not be great. The sound may not be as good as you want. Uh, the camera could be shot a lot better. I could do the filming better but I'm doing this by myself the best I can. Okay, so I apologize for that. Um, there's not much I can do. I, I can't go out and buy a $2,000 camera and a $2,000 lens and invest $4,000 into something like that. I can't, I can't do it. And then buy expensive microphones and everything else. I, I just don't have that kind of money. Okay, I don't have to wear with us for that. If I'm trying to buy a tank and, and try to show you people what to do and, and the products I'm buying out of my pocket, um, 
I just don't have that kind of money. Anyhow, thank you for watching. Until next time, this is Dr. Novak.